Uh, let me open with a story. It's about an old alley cat. An old alley cat came upon a kitten chasing his tail over and over again. The old alley cat was amused and asked the kitten why he kept do doing it for so long. The kitten proudly informed the old alley cat that he had just finished school and was educated on the path to happiness. We were taught that happiness is found in your tail. So I'm going to continue to chase it and catch it with my mouth. The old alley cat smiled and said, I didn't go to school, but I too have learned that happiness is indeed found in your tail. What my experience has taught me is that if you pursue your passion with all of your heart, your tail will follow you everywhere that you go. I think it illustrates uh, something that I see within Christians and uh, within conversations um, outside of our church and around the world, and it's regarding freedom. And because we, as a human condition, struggle to find middle of the road on most anything, the church finds itself divided on grace and law and freedom and what it really looks like to be free. And uh, I want to just kind of build upon what Pastor Steve did last week and what I, I really feel like God's doing within our men, within our men's ministry, what he's doing within our homes. He, he's going after the spaces that are, are real. Uh, we, we need to experience freedom not just some day when we, we transition into the heavenlies, but really giving way to the heavenlies to have its way inside of us so that we can begin to live and experience and show others what is possible. Freedom is never free. Freedom is never free. If, you, if it didn't cost you, it cost somebody. Right. If you've ever heard the phrase that something was government-funded, Government funded is not free. It was paid for by taxpayers. I'm looking at them, right? And grace and forgiveness is a gift to you and I. It's free, but it's, it wasn't free to Jesus. It cost him everything. And I want to read to you eight verses, uh, probably the most important and impactful verses that I'll, I'll read today, really articulating the cost on Jesus that you and I could receive grace and forgiveness. That is so easy to, to take for granted. We take God's grace and his forgiveness for granted so often, yet if we're honest, when it, goes, when it comes back to us to give it, to give grace to other people and to give forgiveness to other people, it's much harder. You don't have to nod your head or agree, but I know it's true. Uh, we, we want God's grace. We want forgiveness. We want people to extend grace to us, and we want forgiveness given to us, but it's, it's equally challenging. And so when we look at the price that Jesus paid, perhaps it would, it would stimulate again within us a heart of gratitude for what it cost him to enjoy what we have today. Isaiah chapter 53, I'm going to read to you uh, 2 through 10 from the Message Bible. The servant grew up before God, a scrawny seedling, a scrubby plant in a parched field. There was nothing attractive about him, nothing to cause us to take a second look. He was looked down on and passed over, a man who suffered, who knew pain firsthand. One look at him, and the people turned away. We looked down on him, thought he was scum. But the fact is, it was our pains he carried, our disfigurements, all the things wrong with us. We thought he brought it upon himself, that God was punishing him for his own failures. But it was our sins that did that to him, that ripped and tore and crushed him, our sins. He took the punishment, and that made us whole. Through the bruises, we get healed. We're all like sheep who've wandered off and gotten lost. We've all done our own thing, gone our own way, and God has piled all our sins, everything we've done wrong, on him, on him. He was beaten. He was tortured. But he didn't say a word. Like a lamb to be slaughtered, and like a sheep being sheared, he took it, it, he took it all in silence. Justice miscarried, and he was let off. And he did anyone really know what was happening? He died without a thought for his own welfare, beaten bloody for the sins of my people. They buried him with the wicked, threw him in a grave with a rich man, even though he'd never hurt a soul or said one word that wasn't true. Still... It's what God had in mind all along, to crush him with pain. The plan was that he give himself as an offering for sin 
so that he'd see life come from it. Life, life, and more life. And God's plan will deeply prosper through him. Let's pray. Father, this morning, it is my prayer that you would help us to have a hunger, a desire, and a conviction of heart to press towards real freedom. God, I thank you for this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus makes a distinction in John chapter 8 between free and free indeed. In the Passion Translation, uh, the, the, the writer uses the phrase unquestionably free. Look with me at John chapter 8, verse number 34. I speak eternal truth, Jesus said. When you sin, you're not free. You become a slave in bondage to your sin. And slaves have no permanent standing in a family like son, like a son does. For a son is part of the family forever. So if the son sets you free from sin, then become a true son and be unquestionably free. The, the, the difference between free and unquestionably free or free and free indeed, I think is best illustrated by thinking of a jail cell. If you are locked up in bondage in a jail cell and someone comes along and unlocks the door and opens it up, you are instantly free, but you're not free indeed until you take a step. You see, Jesus paid the price for us all to be free. The gospel is the good news, like Pastor Steve reminded us, that everyone has already been forgiven. The great assignment that we have is to go let people know that so that they can actually begin to experience freedom. The problem that we have oftentimes when helping others to be free is that we have settled for free, but not free indeed, not unquestionably free. And there's good reasons. And it's a, it's a situation or a thread that probably is gonna touch every one of us if we allow ourselves to be honest. When we talk about freedom, it's simply this, the cost. The cost of your freedom will be your mask and we all have them, or we've dealt with them, or we know what we're talking about when we talk about masks. Masks are there to conceal something that's real. And so we, we have this tendency to put a mask on because we wanna conceal what's really going on and we wanna present best. And, and it works in a lot of our cases, it works for society. In fact, it works within church. If you've been around church for a while, you know how to put on the mask. You know the right phrases to say, you know how to walk through those doors as if you parked your cloud outside and everything has been just perfect. But I don't know about you, but my, my weeks aren't always perfect. They're rarely perfect. And there's a temptation to wear a mask and, and to give a, a, a front to things. But see, that's on the surface level. When, when we talk about the mask of covering up things, it's because we don't want someone to see those areas. And what's really damaging is when we're afraid that God is going to use that against us. I have a lot of conversations with people who are outside the church, who have yet to come to faith or once had a taste of it, but have drifted back into the things of the world. And usually it comes down to a conversation that sounds like I was already struggling. The last thing I wanted was an analyzing religion that's going to make me feel worse about my life. And unfortunately, the church at large historically has painted a picture of God who just wants to smack you for everything you do wrong. And many of us are good enough at smacking ourselves. Why would I purposely invite someone to overly analyze and, and critique and crit criticize my life? And so we wear a mask. Yet the message of the gospel is so much better than that. The writer of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 12. For we have the living word of God, which is full of energy, and it pierces more sharply than a two-edged sword. It will even penetrate to the very core of our being where soul and spirit, bone and marrow meet. It interprets and reveals the true thoughts and secret motives of our hearts. There is not one person who can hide their thoughts from God for nothing that we do remains a secret and nothing created is concealed, but everything is exposed and defenseless before his eyes to whom we must render an account and verse number 14 is where it becomes awesome. Because the reality is your mask isn't hiding anything from him anyway. But he goes on to say in verse 14, so then 
we must cling in faith to all we know to be true. For we have a magnificent king priest, Jesus Christ, the son of God, who rose into the heavenly realm for us and now sympathizes with us in our frailty. Let that sink in. We don't have a cosmic judge who's looking down at us, looking down to find ways to make it harder, to, find, to make you look at the spaces that are damaged instead of looking at him who heals. He, it says that he sympathizes with us because it reveals his humanity. And God put on, he demoted himself, he put on flesh and blood and was presented every challenge that we have. So now, it says verse number 16, now, we come freely and boldly. Let me go back. I'm sorry, I missed verse number 15. He understands humanity for as a man, our magnificent king priest was tempted in every way, just as we are, and conquered sin. So now, verse 16, so now we come freely and boldly to where love enthroned, or where love is enthroned, to receive mercy's kiss and discover the grace we urgently need to strengthen us in our time of weakness. It should be our urgency, first to remind ourselves, but then to remind others that when you're in trouble, we don't run from God, we run to God. We don't have to wear the mask before him because he already knows the thoughts and the things that are hidden anyway. And instead of being afraid of that, he says that we run boldly towards him and we find the grace and the mercy that's needed in our weakest moments. But it's I've also discovered that beyond the mass, what keeps us? Why would we still, even after reading that, why would we still find the necessity to, to cover and to, to hide? I think it's fear. Fear is the primary enemy to freedom. Why? Because we're afraid that it's going to be used against us. If I, re if I remove the mask and I reveal my struggle, I, if I reveal my pain, if I reveal my anger, my unforgiveness, if I, if I reveal my addiction, if I reveal what's, what I'm not overcoming in, what if I get punished for it? What if somebody lashes out? What if, it, what if I'm exposed now? Well, who in the world is going to feel free to reveal the most sensitive spaces in your life if you feel like it's going to be paraded? And the reality is some of us in this room feel like that's what God wants to do. I heard a horrible story. A young man that was the president of the student body of his Christian college. He had a moment of weakness. He went to his leadership and, and told them, repented to the Lord, repented to his leadership. And they demanded that he stand before his student body and tell them all the details of it. And it wrecked his Christian experience. He was mortified. If that's what we think is going to happen, well, of course we're going to cover. Of course we're going to bury. The problem with burying it, when it's a baby, that baby eventually turns into a Goliath. And when it manifests, it'll be at the most inopportune time for you, but a great opportunity for the enemy to destroy your life. Fear is the, free, uh, fear is the enemy of freedom. Because fear is rooted in a fear of punishment. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 16. We have come into an intimate experience with God's love, and we trust in the love he has for us. Before I read on, I just I feel compelled to say this. I, I, and I want to know that I love the Bible. I'm a student of the Bible. I teach from the Bible. My doctrines are based on the Bible. But I personally, and I encourage you to do the same, take my lead on this. I personally do not elevate the Bible above Jesus. We are invited right here to experience intimacy with God. And you will not go into an intimate space of vulnerability with someone that you don't think loves you. And our faith is most activated, Galatians 5, 6, that faith works by love. If you're having trouble seeing faith in your life, confidence in your life, it could be an indicator that you've not experienced his love yet. Let's keep reading. God is love. Those who are living in love are living in God, and God lives through them. By living in God, love has been brought to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly, someone say fearlessly, fearlessly. 
that we might fearlessly or may fiercely face the day of judgment because all that Jesus now is, so are we in this world. Love never brings fear, for fear is always related to punishment. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment far from our hearts. Whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment has not reached love's perfection. The gospel of Jesus is such good news because the message reveals that judgment is removed. When fear of judgment is removed, we are free to be honest about our mass. It's funny, when you make a statement so boldly like that judgment has been removed, internally you want to say amen, but externally you're like, ooh, that's kind of scary. Really? Is all the judgment really removed? According to what Jesus did and what Jesus said, the answer is yes. That your judgment was already dealt with on the cross of Jesus Christ. I want to show you something that's interesting. We need to be studious about how we study the scriptures. It is a dangerous thing to be an American uh, theologian because we are indoctrinated with, with the terminology and words of our modern day, uh, our, the way that we read English isn't always a, dr a direct translation to how the Greek and the Hebrew were written. And we can never make an assumption. There's tools in our, in our Bibles that will help us see things. And this one I, I hope will help some of you that love the Bible as much as I do. Look at John chapter 12, verse number 31. It says, now is the judgment of this world now the ruler of this world will be cast out. This is Jesus talking. Verse number 32, and I, if I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. I wanna spend just a moment here looking at verse number 32. Now on the screen behind me, uh, the word peoples isn't italicized, but in your Bible, it is. Meaning that the translators added it. So if I took the word peoples out of verse number 32, it changes the whole phrase. Let me read it again, minus the word peoples. Jesus says, and if I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all to myself. All what? You need to go one verse back to discover what? I'll draw all judgment to myself. Changes the whole context of that, of that verse. We need to be studious about studying these scriptures and allowing this ancient text to reveal what it wants to reveal, not what we want to see in it. And Jesus is letting us know that all of your judgment has already been taken upon the cross. So if there isn't judgment, now I have to be fearful of punishment. And there's two possible reactions to that kind of statement. One person goes in their mind, oh man, but you can't say that. You can't tell people that there's no judgment, but what in the world is going to keep them from just running out of here and sinning? And then there's the other thought. <laughs> Woohoo! There's no judgment! <laughs> Let's go crazy. <laughs> what would keep us from sinning against God and sinning against one another? The answer is love. The answer is love. I, I made a commitment, a, a contract, a covenant with Becky on our wedding day. But just because I verbalized it and wrote it on a document, that is not what keeps me faithful to her. I am faithful to my wife because I am head over heels in love with this woman. I don't want to sin against you because you're my brother, my sister. Right? So love is what keeps me from sinning. And Jesus is wanting us to, to depend on the gift of the Holy Spirit because here's the reality. Just because God is not bringing punishment and judgment on you and I because of our sin, sin brings all kinds of punishment and judgment onto your life. And so we've got to take the conversation seriously. But if we think that God's adding to the pressure or stress, I'm not going to run to the source who is my very ability to overcome these broken spaces and allow these areas that, that need to be healed to be made whole. Jesus made a comment about the Holy Spirit. He says, it's to your benefit. It's an upgrade for me to go and to send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't get a lot of talk in our churches. 
It's usually categorized as just part of the Trinity left there, or we've got some of our churches that the Holy Spirit is just the, the manifestation of the gifts, but really the Holy Spirit is there as a empowerment. He's a helper, and he's a continuation of the ministry of Jesus now on the inside of you. John chapter 16, Jesus says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Verse number seven, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Now watch verse number eight. He, he makes three distinctions here that's easily over missed. Three distinctions of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Verse eight, he says, and when he comes, first, he will convict the world of sin. Secondly, and of righteousness. And thirdly, of judgment. And then in verse number nine, he defines who gets what. Look at verse number nine. He says, of sin, because they. Someone say they. they. Jesus is talking to his believers, his disciples. So if he was talking to them, he would say you. But Jesus said, of sin, because they do not believe in me. The Holy Spirit is convicting the unbeliever of sin so they become aware of their need of a rescuer, a savior. Now watch, Jesus makes it personal to them and to you and I who are believers of righteousness because I go to my father and you see me no more. The Holy Spirit is not convicting you of sin. He's convicting you of righteousness. And it sounds like this. Don't do that. That's contrary to your nature. That's not who you are. He reminds you of who you are, not what you were. This is good stuff, man. That deserves at least a welfare amen. amen. Thank you. Verse 11, of judgment, speaking now of the enemy, Satan, the devil, because the ruler of this world is judged. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth and he will not speak on his own authority. That means that he has things to say. It is normal as a child of God to hear the father through the voice of the Holy Spirit. But whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. Here in this natural world, we build on strength, not weakness. If you've ever built a house, you make sure the foundation is strong before you ever erect a house or a building on it. The same is true of the Holy Spirit. He builds on strength, not on weakness. The Holy Spirit will speak to your strength. He'll speak to your identity. He'll speak to your nature. And you ought to do the same. If we're not careful, we'll, we'll get into a dilution not delusion, but a delusion or displacement. Because the reality is, when, when you take a concentration of something and you begin to add a foreign agent to it, you dilute it or you displace the concentrated formula. Let me, uh, I was looking at this morning, Galatians. The Apostle Paul words it this way. It's not in my notes, um, but just take, take note of this. Galatians chapter 6, verse number 7 and 8, the Apostle Paul says, Make no mistake about it, God will never be mocked. For what you plant will always be the very thing that you harvest. The harvest you reap reveals the seed that was planted. If you plant the corrupt seed of self-life into the natural realm, you can expect to experience a harvest of corruption. If you plant the good seeds of the spirit of life, you will reap the beautiful fruits that grow from the everlasting life of the Spirit. The, the, the life that you live, the level of freedom that you experience has everything to do with your decisions. What are you planting in your life? If we're not careful, we'll plant to our carnal, natural, fleshly, sin leaning in toward old ways, and we'll begin to experience a life that is less than what God wants for you. I, I'm going to go way out on a limb on this one, just, just because I'm kind of feeling daring today. I don't believe that you can support within Scripture that committing a sin makes you a sinner if you're already born again in Christ and a new nature. You, you see, I'm a, I'm a human being. 
And if I decide starting today that I'm just gonna start barking like a dog, I'm gonna start living like a dog, I'm not gonna become a dog, I'm still human. But I'm gonna experience what dogs experience, which is way less than what God has for me as a human to experience. Your sinning isn't gonna change your nature. It's gonna change your life. And if we're not careful, we can become so callous. Now that becomes another conversation. That if you're so callous to the message of the gospel, I think it's at least reasonable to have the conversation to say that may, perhaps you could reject it. So taking sin serious is important, but making it the main thing is not the main thing. It's listening to the spirit of God and allowing him to speak to who you really are. It's removing the mask, knowing that judgment is not going to come. The punishment of God was placed on the cross. And now, if I really want to experience freedom of life, to experience happiness, you know, happiness is based on your happenings. There's a lot of Christians that could use some happiness in their lives. The world could use some happy Christians. And in order to experience some happiness in your life, you're going to have to start making some decisions. And I'm not saying now is the time that we pull up our bootstraps and we take this Christian life on by our own strength. Absolutely not. The Christian life isn't hard. It's impossible. That's why he gave us the helper, the Holy Spirit, to speak truth into our lives. We have the scriptures to, to speak into our lives. I'm out of time, but I just want to, I want to point out... Uh, no, I'm going to leave that be. I'm going to leave it be. I'm ready. Okay, I will. I'll make this really fast. I'll make, I'll make it really fast. I got, I got to be mindful of our children's church. A couple weeks ago, a few weeks ago, us men went to a men's conference in Milwaukee. And there were several dynamic speakers, but one of them that, that spoke to me probably the most was a, a, a gentleman by the name of Carlos Whitaker. And hit, the topic of his talk was Kill the Spider. And I'm looking at this, this topic going, how in the world is this brother going to make a, 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 a talk or a sermon out of a title like that? And I'm going I'm to break it down. He also wrote a book called Kill the Spider. I just finished it. It's a great book. I recommend it. But he, um, he, he was seeing a therapist, and I'm going to just cut in about midway. He's seeing a therapist, and finally he says to his doctor, the counselor, he says, look, how, how long do you think that I need to continue to meet with you week after week? And, and uh, because he kind of made a joke. He's like, because you're, you're kind of costing me a fortune. And, and the, the doctor says, Carlos, and I quote, please give me some liberty here. I quote, the doctor said, we need to meet Carlos as long as it takes to find out why you, why you keep throwing crap at God's blessing on your life. Well, it offended him that he said it, but then it hit him hard that he's like, he's right. I do. So he calls his hero, his dad. He says, dad, why do I keep throwing crap on God's blessings on my life? And his dad says, I have a story for you. He's like, Dad, I don't have time for a story. Just tell me why I'm doing this. He says, I was preaching a revival. And at the end of the night one, a lady came up to the altar and she said, Pastor, I need you to pray for me that God would remove the cobwebs from my life. And he thought, what a brilliant, brilliant uh, word analogy. So yeah, he prays over here. They get an agreement that God would clear the cobwebs from her life. Night number two, woman makes her way up to the, to the altar at the end of the service. Pastor, we need to pray more intently. We got to get after this thing. Praise, pray again for me that God would remove the cobwebs from my life. He said, well, I felt pretty good about last night, you know, and um, I'll pray with you again, but I, I, I think that God's got this. So they pray again. Third night, service is done. Lady makes a beeline for the, for the altar. Pastor, you got to pray for me that God would remove the cobwebs. He says, I will not. I will not pray tonight that God would remove the cobwebs. I'm praying that God will kill the spider. And he said, Carlos, you need to kill the spider. What we do, like the alley cat chasing his tail, is we're cleaning up the cobwebs over and over and over again, but we're not experiencing freedom until we kill the spider. And until we go to those spaces where we know that God believes in us, we know that God is loving towards us, that he's not wanting to expose us or rub our nose in our crap like a puppy who just had an accident. He wants to rescue you. And it's gonna take you walking with him out of the jail cell into a place that's really free indeed. 
I believe that this is where God is taking us as a church. I'm, I'm, I believe that there's messages to come both through our guests and from the, our, our team here, that God is taking us into these areas where we're gonna be free like we've never been free before because this is where God's called us to be. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me? I wanna pray over you. I'm glad I squeezed that in. I made time. <laughs> Father, thank you so much for this vulnerable time of realness. Now, right here, before we leave and just say that was a great message or, man, that's going to be good for someone else. God, help us right now. Reveal the spiders. It doesn't even matter where that leads us. God, we want to kill the spider. That the mask would be removed and we would allow you into these spaces that are harmed, broken, wounded or we're bound or addicted. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would move in such a personal way in each one of your sons and daughters, to each one of us here, to anyone here who is yet to surrender their life to you. May this be that moment of courageous faith where we say we can't do it, but we believe that you can and that you paid a price for my freedom. And by my faith in you, I'm going to walk out a life that really looks free indeed. I speak that over each one of us. In Jesus' name, amen.